Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Zion. Our worship service starts at 1015. We're a few, we're a few minutes over that. <laughs> it's good to have everyone here. We want to welcome friends, guests, attenders. Everyone is welcome to our worship. We want to take a moment if you have any announcements to make, please come forward this time. So if you look in your bulletin, there are several things coming up. Today, um, there will be a potluck at Charlie and Cheryl, Seth and Eliza's place at 530, so please note that. And also other things that will be happening um, on September 11th. Also, we are considering nominations for our elders and please note that you've gotten an email and uh, that you would participate in the nomination of new elders. You've probably heard of the pastor Rick Warren, who is pastor at Saddleback Church in California. He also wrote the Purpose Driven Life book and his church is famous for hospitality. The church welcomes strangers as guests instead of visitors. And what I like about what he says is that guests, when we refer to newcomers as guests, that we are implying that this is someone whom we do everything for, that we welcome, we make them feel comfortable, we answer their questions, and we hope that they come back as a guest. Visitors, not so much do visitors come back, but if we refer to people as guests, then we hope that they appreciate our welcoming atmosphere, our hospitality, and choose to come back. And it's usually not a sermon that will bring people back to a congregation. Good hosts welcome and respond, orient guests to church life, classes, worship, because those guests are deciding whether or not to come back. First impressions really matter. So our theme today is on hospitality and as we're thinking about that, I want to thank this congregation again for your hospitality to the Lapp family during Claudia's memorial service. We have a wonderful facility to host a family. We have things to offer like music, singing, food. And I just want to thank everyone who participated and helped to make the Lapp family and their guests and friends welcome in this place. Would you pray with me? God, we think of those stories of people who showed hospitality in the Bible. And I ask that you would help us take a deep look into the heart of hospitality today. Help us understand that the generosity the world needs often demands some on our part. We ask that you would be with those who have never known a table blessed by laughter and welcome. Those who have seldom heard affirmations and who do not know your abiding love. Remind us, God, that we are to set many tables, to speak blessings often to others, and to be your love in the world. We are all invited to the feast at God's table with all people of the earth as we follow Jesus. Amen. 
Louise, let's come, come and lead us in singing. Please turn to number four. Number four. Number four. Uh, Moses on. Now number 42, Karen's going to play. You might recognize this tune as what we've heard as Hark, We Hear the Harps Eternal. Surely, surely, 
Number 74. Thank you for your generous giving and commitment to Zion. Would you um, join me in an offering and a prayer for our offering? God, you give us life, and we offer commitment. You give us scripture, we must study. You give us talents, we must minister. You give us the church, we must extend fellowship. You give us the gospel, we must share the good news. You give us each other, we must live in love. You give us money, we must invest in the eternal. O oh, giver of all that we call good and perfect, Transform our gratitude for what you have placed within our hands into significant means of serving others as well as you. Amen. We're going to take a moment to pass the peace with one another. And as we do that, the children are going to collect coins for us and then come up front for the children's story. So please greet and pass the peace and also have your loose change available for the children.
right, we are gonna do the children's story. Is everybody up here that's coming? All the coins went in? Okay, listen guys and gal. <laughs> I don't want you to get it too comfortable. We're gonna do some moving around when we get started. So we need everybody to stand up. I don't want you guys to come over here. And I want you to walk up the stairs. We gotta come all the way down here. And you're just gonna walk up the stairs and go sit down over there by my chair. Can you guys do that? Okay, go right on up the stairs and go sit over there by my black chair. You can go too, Libby. Okay, everybody sit down. You ready for a children's story? Okay, now you gotta get all the way up and you gotta come back down to this side. I told you we were gonna be moving around. We get the wiggles out. Come all the way down. Okay, now, I need somebody to read me. What does this mat say? Say it really loud. Welcome, welcome friends. Welcome. Okay, so there's a welcome mat, and it says welcome friends. And this time, when you come up on the stage, I want you to walk across the welcome mat, and then go sit down. Can we do that? Okay, ready, go. Hi, good morning, welcome to I'm so glad you guys are here. I missed you so much. It's so much better now that everybody's here and welcome and your smiling faces and we're all here together to learn. Somebody raise your hand and tell me what was different when you came up the stairs that time and when you came up the stairs this time. There was no mat. How did that make you feel when there was a welcome mat on one side? <laughs> yeah? It made, it made me feel more welcome. It made you feel more welcome. What about when you walked up this side? Did I say anything to you at all? No? I just said, like, go sit down, right? Did anybody hear what I said when you guys were coming up on this side? Yeah. What did I say? Welcome, I'm glad to see you, I missed you. Well, we are learning today about a big word called hospitality. Have you guys heard that word before? So you have heard it? What do you know about it? I, I've just heard of it. Just heard it? So that is a word that helps us welcome people so that when people come here, they feel like they wanna be here. So think about something you could do. If you saw somebody new here that you hadn't met before, what could you do to help them feel welcome? Say hello, how, how's your day? That's awesome, say hello, how's your day? What else could we do? Could we say, oh, there's an empty chair right next to me, do you wanna sit by me? Or we could say, you might not know where the drinking fountain is or the bathroom, I can show you. What about at school? What could you do to make somebody feel welcome at your school? To, to say that you can, if, if you're, you're sad, then you could say, do you want to play with me? And if you're mean, then we have friends to play with. That's perfect. You could ask somebody to play with you. You can even do that at your house. When people come over to your house, they can help them feel welcome. You guys are pretty smart, so I'm gonna ask you a tricky question. I wanna see if you guys know this. Who do you think is welcome at our church? Everybody. Everybody is welcome at our church. That is exactly right. Sometimes it can be tricky when we welcome new people. We might be shy to say hi, or we might be nervous, or we might rather play with our friends. There is a guy in the Bible named Peter. He wrote parts of the Bible, and he says, in 1 Peter 4, 9, he says, be hospitable to one another without complaining. So we don't normally have Bible verses during the children's story, but we're gonna try to learn that one this morning. So let's say that one together. Be hospitable, you guys say it with me, be hospitable to one another without complaining. Can we try it all together? Be hospitable to one another without complaining. And that comes from 1 Peter 4, 9. So I have a coloring sheet for you guys. 
that has a picture of a church on it and it says the word welcome on it why don't you guys all grab one of those so you can work on that back at your seat to remind us to welcome everybody that comes to church even maybe it's a little bit tricky or we feel a little shy don't leave yet okay there's one more for you all right would anybody like to pray for us and i'll help you pray if you want help before we go anybody want to do our closing prayer no no takers today okay let's pray dear god thank you so much for making us feel welcome so that we can help make other people feel welcome give us ideas and things to say when we see somebody new or maybe even just somebody we haven't seen for a while thank you for loving us and for welcoming us in this name amen okay you guys can go back to your seats Thank you, Ann, for that story. I'm reading from Luke 14, verses 1 to 14, and this is from the New English Translation. Now, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of the leader of the Pharisees, they were watching him closely. There, right in front of him, was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. So Jesus act, asked the experts in religious law and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So Jesus took a hold of the man, healed him, and sent him away. Then he said to them, which of you, if you have a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, would not immediately pull him out? but they could not reply to this. Then when Jesus noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. He said to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor because a person more distinguished than you may have been invited by your host. So the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your place then ashamed you will begin to move to the least important place but when you are invited go and take the least important place so that when your is he will say to you friend move up here to a better place then you will be honored in the presence of all who share the meal with you for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you host a dinner or a banquet, don't you invite your friends? Don't invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors so you can be, um, hang on here, so you can be invited by them in return and get repaid. But when you host an elaborate meal, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind then you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for what you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous steve come and share be with you still working through our congregational covenant statement and we're in the final stretch let's read the statement together from the inside of your bulletin zion mennonite church covenants to grow together as a christ-centered community worshiping god extending our anabaptist branch into our world bearing the lasting fruit of discipleship and planting the seeds for God's reign through hospitality, service, and reconciliation with God and others. So this morning we'll tackle the first 
of listed three character characteristics of the reign of God, or three attributes of the kingdom of God. These are kingdom ethics, kingdom values, uh, values of God's kingdom, hospitality, service, and reconciliation. Granted, these aren't the only attributes of God's kingdom, but there's some pretty good ones. Just for kicks, uh, apart from hospitality, service, and reconciliation, let's shout out some attributes of the kingdom of God. Okay, I'll start. Eternal, abundant. What was that? Forgiving. Forgiving. Loving. Missed that one. Welcoming. Joy. Accepting. Joy. Kind. Kind. Okay. Peaceful. Peaceful. Thank you. I'm a long ways away up here. So our covenant statement specifically says planting the seeds of God's reign through hospitality, service, and reconciliation. So there's the ag motif again, agriculture, with planting the seeds. So as we've been going through this, I've poked a little fun at the ag motif that keeps popping up a little bit. If I'm honest, though, I've got to admit it's growing on me. Okay, so as followers of Jesus, our understanding of hospitality comes from Jesus. This certainly shouldn't be a surprise. We've spent so much time talking about Jesus being our center, our example that we continue to strive for as disciples. The Spirit of God continues to shape us into Christ-likeness. So, Jesus is our example for hospitality and what that means. It's fairly simple, but it's definitely not easy. This isn't an easy text, Luke 14. It's not an easy topic, hospitality, the hospitality of Jesus, because Jesus was radically hospitable. Author Lonnie Collins Pratt explains it like this. Hospitality is at the heart of humanity. No one has ever been more radically welcoming than Jesus, who was always accused of associating with the wrong kind of people, people we wouldn't want in our living rooms or next to us worshiping. Jesus was often critiqued for his hospitality, but it wasn't just because of who Jesus welcomed and was willing to associate with. Jesus was critiqued for his hospitality because of the way his hospitality challenged positions of power and privilege. It wasn't just that Jesus welcomed people, it was that how and when Jesus welcomed people challenged the accepted system of exclusion. It was how Jesus challenged the boundary making of those comfortable in their positions of privilege and status. There are many passages of scripture we could turn to to find Jesus' example of hospitality at work. For this morning, we'll look at just one of those passages, Luke 14, verses 1 to 14. There are three sections to this passage. The first is Jesus, one of the many dinner guests, decides to heal a man who, incidentally, didn't ask to be healed. And Jesus made it a lesson for everyone there, a bit awkward. Then in the second section, Jesus speaks directly to the guests at the meal. In the third section, Jesus speaks directly to the host of the meal. All throughout these three sections, we can assume Everyone there could hear what Jesus was saying, no matter who he was saying it to. The, the lessons Jesus teaches about hospitality are intended for all people there, not just a select few. And even with all the tension that existed between Jesus and the Pharisees, between Jesus and the and religious law, 
the fact that Jesus is teaching these lessons to them tells us that Jesus hadn't given up on them either. Jesus' goal in these lessons was and is to invite all people to reorient their lives around the kingdom of God, to embody kingdom ethics, kingdom hospitality. Jesus' first lesson is about a misguided religious tradition. And Luke, who is the writer, starts us off with a nice transitional time marker in his writing. He shows that something different is happening. What was happening before has ended, and now something new is happening. Time markers are a writer's way of transitioning from one scene to another. So Luke starts us off with one Sabbath. When Jesus went to share a meal in the home of one of the leaders of the Pharisees, they were watching him closely. The scene is set. It's Sabbath, and Jesus is being watched closely by all the other guests at the home of a high-ranking Pharisee. Jesus regularly observed the Sabbath. Luke's Gospel shows us that Jesus was a good Jewish man, followed the customs. Here in this scene, Jesus has been invited to the home of one of the leading Pharisees along with other guests, many of them experts in Jewish religious law. There were very important customs around mealtime in this culture. First century Mediterranean culture also used mealtimes to attribute power and status. Meals like this were the social capital of their day. Who invited who to dinner? Who accepted the invitation? Who sat where? All revealed a person's level of importance and prominence within their community, within their social structure of the day. It was kind of like the school cafeteria, but with much higher stakes. Who you ate with mattered. As a host, you would intentionally invite people of higher social status so you could move up the ladder of influence. But if you aimed too high and someone rejected your invitation because they didn't want to tarnish their reputation by attending, you would be shamed. Likewise, if you were invited to a meal, it would be important to consider who else had accepted the invitation. Attending a meal with those of too low of status would bring shame on you as well. So Jesus is at the home of one of the leading Pharisees enjoying a Sabbath meal, and everyone is watching him closely to see what he will do. Will he himself and confirm the suspicions that he is a social outcast, or will he rise to the occasion and bring those around him up the ladder because of their associations with him? Either way, it's an introvert's nightmare. Dinner parties, social climbers, small talk, and chit-chat. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. But that's the scene where Jesus is. That's the scene where Jesus is when he finds a man suffering from the swelling of his body, excess fluid. Probably something that used to be called dropsy now called generalized edema, or body swelling, due to an excess of fluid. Could possibly be the result of congestive heart failure or a kidney disease, and this man is in front of Jesus, the text says. A sign that this man with this disease was given a place of higher honor than Jesus, in front of him. Perhaps this was a trap set by these religious rulers who are already aware of Jesus' willingness to heal on the Sabbath. We get a look at Luke's wonderful writing here because of the comparison between the sick man and the Pharisees. It's said that there is no one as dry as a person with dropsy meaning they have an insatiable thirst and yet are plagued with already too much fluid in the body that can't be released. 
They have too much, and yet they continue to seek more and more. The link between this man's ailment and the habits of the Pharisees, always wanting more power and more influence, would not have been lost on the early readers of Luke's text. Being a, at a socially important meal on a Sabbath with a high-ranking Pharisee and all his equally influential cohorts raises... raises questions. Pharisees are deeply concerned with ritual, ritual purity, especially during meals, so following Sabbath customs and behaviors was essential. In the midst of this, it's interesting to me that Jesus doesn't ask the man if he wants to be healed. It's interesting to me that the man doesn't first ask Jesus. In this story, According to Luke, the man doesn't say anything to Jesus, and Jesus doesn't say anything directly to the man. At least, not that Luke says. Jesus heals the man with a sickness that's on display to everyone. And Jesus turns it into an object lesson for everyone there gathered. Jesus asks, does the law allow healing on the Sabbath or not? Silence. Silence. So Jesus continues the lesson. Suppose your child or an ox fell into a ditch on the Sabbath day. Wouldn't you immediately pull it out? Again, silence from the group. They were all watching him, these experts in religious law and high-ranking Pharisees. And while watching, they were concerned with their own status and social position. So Jesus challenges one of their accepted religious practices that put law above love. It was against their religious law to work on the Sabbath. It's one of the Ten Commandments that we talked about a few weeks ago, Sabbath holy. Plowing a field was certainly considered work, and you weren't allowed to plow a field. Incidentally, they also considered leveling any type of crevice plowing a field. In fact, it's written in Jewish religious law like this. A person who has mud on his feet may clean it off on a wall or on a beam, but not on the ground, lest he level crevices. A person should not spit on the ground and wipe it with his feet, lest crevices be leveled. It is, however, permitted to step on spittle that's lying on the ground as one walks without having any specific intent. So Jesus challenges accepted religious practice by his actions and his words. In healing the sick man working on the Sabbath, Jesus invites his meal companions to reorient their lives, beginning with their religious customs, around the values of the kingdom of God. Love before law. Not only has Jesus healed the sick, but Jesus has invited all the guests who suffer from the insatiable thirst for more power and influence to be healed. And everyone there, the high-ranking Pharisees and religious law experts, have no rebuttal. Love as the fulfillment of the law. All they can do is remain silent, and that silence further establishes Jesus' status as an authoritative teacher. So, Jesus goes on to teach them another lesson. This time it's directed to the guests. Jesus knows they have been paying careful attention to who is sitting where, and once seated, who gets moved closer or farther away from the host. The one sitting next to the host is in the seat of highest honor. So, be careful of your aspirations. Better to let the host move you to a place of honor than assume such a place on your own and suffer shame when you're corrected in front of the whole group. After this lesson to the guest, Jesus extends a third lesson to the host of the meal. Again, while this lesson is directed toward the host, it's really a lesson for everyone there to overhear and apply. In their overhearing, Jesus is inviting all of his meal companions again 
to reorient their lives around the kingdom of God. Love is the fulfillment of the law radical hospitality. To the host, Jesus explains, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Such a suggestion would have been completely atrocious. Following Jesus' advice would have upset the political and social structure of their culture. Mealtime practices guided and developed a system of reciprocity. That system of reciprocity, who owed you hospitality and to whom did you owe hospitality in return, that was how much of their political and social systems functioned. Purposely inviting those who can do nothing for you in return was wasted time and wasted effort because it brought no results and no reciprocity. New Testament scholar and theologian Joel Green explains the impact of Jesus' teaching. Because the sharing of food is a, delicate and is a delicate barometer of social relations, when Jesus subverts conventional mealtime practices related to seating arrangements and invitations, he's doing far more than offering sage counsel to his table companions. Rather, he's toppling the familiar world of the ancient Mediterranean, overturning its socially constructed reality and replacing it with what must have been regarded as a scandalous alternative. This passage from Luke brings two views of table fellowship into focus. For Pharisees and the social elites, meals functioned to establish in-group boundaries. Honor, reciprocity, privilege. You only ate with those who could benefit you or needed benefit from you and could, in turn, repay that benefit and set point in the future. For Jesus and the kingdom of God, there is only radical hospitality. The table of God is defined by sharing, by celebrating, by inviting, by suspending boundaries and the inclusion of the wrong kind of people. In Jesus' day, the wrong kind of people were referred to as tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. God's table, rather than exclusion and boundary making, results in new bonds of community being established that include who was once the outsider. In the kingdom of God, there is radical hospitality, and that radical hospitality challenged existing religious practices of exclusion and followers to reorient their lives around kingdom of God ethics. So, what do we do with this? Some traits of radical hospitality, and these are a few that I've come up with. And in community, we discern what radical hospitality looks like. So here's at least one and a few more for me to offer this morning. One, recognize we don't belong. We can never repay Jesus for his radical hospitality expressed toward us. We are the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind that get invited. We are the ones who do not deserve an invitation to the table, yet we have been given a seat of honor. Since we do not belong at the table, we graciously and joyfully receive the invitation we have and we can welcome others who don't belong just like us with open arms. Another, we're invited to be open to receive. Hospitality means we recognize the value and the contribution others have and can give us, especially those who are significantly different. Radical hospitality recognizes the gifts of others that we are enriched by. Radical hospitality also means listening well. Listening well means opening ourselves to being changed by what we hear and what we learn. 
The lessons taught by Jesus at the table in Luke 14 challenged the accepted religious practices of their day. Are we attentive to the religious practices Jesus is challenging today? Because I guarantee you, we have not arrived at a perfect and complete expression of faithful Christianity. Not this side of heaven. Radical hospitality also involves empowering others and relinquishing control. Jesus didn't micromanage. He empowered his followers and, when this, and with the Spirit of God to guide them, left them to discern and chart out what faithfulness in this world looks like with the Spirit's help. Also, we learn the radical hospitality of Jesus, that Jesus didn't despise the Pharisees and these experts in the religious law. Not only does radical hospitality invite the outcast, but it doesn't write off the religious establishment or organized religion. Jesus didn't despise the Pharisees. He's in the home of the ruling Pharisee for a meal. While there, Jesus invites all the company, the Pharisees, experts in religious law, and the social elite, to embrace Jesus' message about the radical hospitality of the kingdom of God. Jesus invites them to reorient their lives around that kingdom. He did not write them off. All are in need of Jesus' warning and invitation to practice hospitality to the least and the left out. The radical hospitality of Jesus challenges us and invites us. Radical hospitality challenges customs of religious boundary keeping, who's in and who's out. It challenges the priority of religious law above love, and rather places love as the fulfillment of law. Love God and love our neighbor. Hospitality challenges and it invites. Jesus' hospitality is so radical that the outsiders are invited and welcomed to the table. Even outsiders like us. We are the Gentiles welcomed to the table of our Lord through Jesus' radical hospitality. We do not belong, none of us, yet we have an open and standing invitation. The radical hospitality of Jesus invites us to the table. Sometimes our meals function to establish honor, in-group identity and reciprocity. While it's not as pronounced as the first century Mediterranean cultures was, we do have customs and traditions, some religious customs, that determine group identity. While the radical hospitality of Jesus makes room for us at the table, it also challenges our understanding of who deserves a place in the chair right next to us at the table. As followers of Jesus, those who seek to keep Christ as our center, the radical hospitality of Jesus is challenging us and inviting us to make more room at the table. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for the burden of your example of radical hospitality. Thank you for the presence of your spirit that continues to nudge and guide and direct how we live out um, hospitality in our world. Help us to be attentive to your word, attentive to your spirit, um, keeping you center, um, focusing on you as our example. Help us to continue to live out hosp hospitality in ways that would be faithful to you and to your example to your word and to the spirit leading in our lives as individuals and as a community of faith. Amen.
please take note in the back of your bulletin of different prayer requests. Um, also, just a reminder that we want to pray for those that will be attending the church camp out. Um, in their announcement in the bulletin, you're invited to a potluck that they will be having um, at Silver Creek Falls on Saturday. So just take note of that. Andy Colomb is the contact person if you have any questions and want more information on that. We want to pray for Ben Wing, who is a friend of ours. I think a lot of you are following his updates on Caring Bridge, which is a website. If you'd like to know about that, talk to me. But um, he was in a bad car accident a month ago and is still in the hospital recovering. We want to remember Ben and his family. We want to pray for our teachers, um, staff of schools and administrators as they prepare for a new school year. And then also just remembering countries that are war-torn, um, the trauma that people are experiencing around the world and in our country with floods and um, different things. So let's go to prayer. God, we believe that you welcome us all to your banquet table. Help us to open our arms to embrace you as we see you in the face of a stranger, as we welcome you in the love of friends. We believe you welcome the abandoned, the misfits, the wretched to your feast. And we confess there are times when we have allowed our prejudices to overrule and rejected you because others are different. God, we believe there's beauty hidden in each person. Forgive us for the times when we have failed to see your face because you are disabled, poor, or homeless. We believe we are all precious in your sight. We remember those in this community that are struggling. We pray for Ben Wing and his family. Lord, thank you for friends and family and medical staff that have been supportive through his recovery. We just ask that your hand of healing would be on Ben, restoring his injuries, bringing him to good health, that he could have a complete return to normal brain functions. Lord, thank you for teachers. We ask that you would energize, give that creative um, skills to them. Thank you for their gifts of teaching young people. And we just pray for their patience and strength and courage in this new school year. We pray for countries like Ethiopia and Ukraine experiencing violence and human rights violations. And we read of many Mennonites among, are among the traumatized people who have lost their homes and loved ones, yet are also caring for people who are displaced. God, we pray for an end to violence, for your peace to be with all humanity. We believe we're called to share life together as members of one family. And we ask your forgiveness when we have been unconcerned for others' suffering, failed to see others in the worldwide community 
as you do. God, we are all invited to feast at your banquet table. And we pray for fellowship and fun, laughter, and meaningful conversation with those attending the camp out this week. And we ask for those things today as we join in a meal and a potluck this afternoon. We are all welcomed into God's eternal kingdom with all peoples on earth. And we lift these prayers as we pray your prayer that you taught your disciples together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn to number 209. This tune is La Globand. It was the one um, reference to hospitality in this book. Note especially the second verse. <laughs> 